How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. And it is Monday here on the show. You know what that means? What's wrong with my camera? Oh, man, somebody messed it up when I was gone. What the heck happened? Well, we'll deal with that in a moment. Hello, off from the side. Somebody's going to get it. Anyway, I'm back. We got a lot to get into here today, and uh, I believe we will be joined by Filthy Tom Lawler when we come back from the break. But I can't promise that because apparently he's uh, he's got a connection issue. But he's scheduled to be here today because Mike Semper VB is not available. But uh, we got a lot to talk about on our show, and uh, we will not be doing a afternoon show here today, Tom and I. But Tom does have something special that he's planning, so he'll tell you about that. As we get going here. But a lot to talk about from a busy weekend. There were a million shows. We had the uh, Elimination Chamber on uh, late Friday night, early Saturday, which was the final pay-per-view stop on the road to WrestleMania. It was exactly as you would expect. And we now have more matches for WrestleMania. We could talk about Bronson Reed and Raquel and Finn what happened with them at the pay-per-view, as well as Sammy Zayn, I'm sorry, Sammy Guevara, who uh, apparently looked like he got injured on the Collision Show, but in fact he did not. And of course we've got notes on New Japan, another former WWE wrestler alleged to have been propositioned by a company official in the 1980s. This was a story I did not expect to see today. And we've had Kevin Owens commenting on Vince McMahon. We got Rock coming back for multiple episodes of SmackDown, and as noted, a lot of show reviews. So, a lot to get into here today. Back in a moment with more as I fix this thing up, Observer Live. You know, that was a very special night for me. Um, And I've listened to Cody about it. It's not one of his... It's not his top match, he says, but man, it's mine. You know what I mean? It's uh, very special in my heart. And to do that at 50, right, is uh, it's just a, it's a great achievement for somebody like me, man. It really is to be in my kind of my, st- my shape still, in good shape to be able to go out there with the young, young kids and pull things off. Um, it's, it's so amazing, you know, when, I was so nervous when we, you know, Cody's music hit and he broke the throne with a sledgehammer and all that. I'm just waiting for my, my entrance, right? And this new upstart company, AEW, I didn't know how the fans would respond to me, uh, whether they would boo me or whether they would, you know, cheer me or whatever. So I'm so nervous and I'm so laser focused on what I'm doing, but it, it was like, God, my butterflies in my stomach were crazy. My music hit and they responded in kind and I was like, okay, it's not so bad. And I'm always like that. As soon as I go through the tunnel, it goes away, right? And then I'm laser focused on what I need to do, man. And it's like, it was good to feel that reaction from the, a new fan base that had watched me my whole career, but they're different than WWE fans. <laughs> to go down there and, you know, um, I've explained this before and it's, Let's see if you can understand it. I step in the ring, right, and they start chanting Dusty's name, right, which really just, oh, man, you know, chills on your on your body. You're in the moment. You're so laser focused. And you hear that for a moment because I point to the, to the sky. I point up, and they started to chant Dusty. And then all of a sudden, the sound and everybody in the arena has become blurry to me. Right. I can hear them, but I can't hear them. I can see them, but I can't. I'm so focused on Cody and what we need to do right now to get it to where it is. Because for years and years, I was told, no, it wasn't good enough to be on WrestleMania or whatever. So we had a thing to prove here and I was focused about it. And we probably could have done a couple things wrong in that match and it still wouldn't have mattered. It was so good. The story was built in one promo a piece. They were ready for it. All the stars aligned. The magic happens. And we struck lightning. 
and it was really cool to do. And I think that match will go down in history as, as you know, one of the greatest matches of all time. You know, there's some great matches out there, but I think it really, it, it holds water. I think it, it's going to be talked about for 10 years from now, you know, 15, 20 years from now. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Flying solo here at the moment, as uh, Mike Sempervivi is uh, not available today. It is his birthday, or at least he's doing a birthday celebration today. And uh, Filthy Tom is desperately trying to connect to this program, and we'll see if he can make it on. But we do have a lot to talk about here today. Lots to talk about. So, let's get going. Yeah, Tom still can't get on. I don't know what's going on. It seemed like he got on fine when I was gone. I think, I'll bet you anything, his internet cord is not hooked up. All the bet is what it is. The power went out while you... Oh, great. Well, Jared, can you tell... Uh, can you tell... See, this is what happens when we're on the air. All right, hold on. It's going to be awesome for those of you that are uh, anybody walking or listening. I'm going to try something here. I'm going to send this to Tom. Watch us do this live. Send this to Tom. See if you can connect manually. Why did my power go out? What's going on, Jared? Why did my power go out? When my power goes out, everything goes wrong. That's what we've determined. So, anyway. Another former WWE wrestler is alleged he was propositioned by a company official in the 80s. Nick Kaniski, son of Observer Hall of Famer Gene Kaniski, wrestled with WWF from 1986 to 1987. He appeared on an episode of Paula Thurston recently, said he was forced to deal with unwanted advances, from WWF employee Terry Garvin during that time. He said he would come up to me and hit on me. I won't say what he said, but you'll understand the meaning behind it. He said, hey, Nick, let me perform something on you. You can read a Playboy, and you'll have it made for life. And, you know, he is my boss. He controls my boss. This is my livelihood, and I want to, what I want to do. I kind of joked with him. I said, you know, Terry, I'm not that way, but if I ever change, you'll be the first we just kind of laughed it up, but he was always kind of coming up and joking. And one time he came to my hotel room late at night. I told him to leave, knocked at the door. So it put me in a very awkward position. He said he informed Vince McMahon of the situation. He said, I remember where it was. It was in Milwaukee, Oregon. We wrestled in Portland. I called Vince. I said, hey, Vince, I don't know. I don't think this is right. Terry's hitting on me. I don't appreciate that. And I would like to, I would like it to stop. And Vince said, okay, I'll deal with it. And that was it. But nothing changed. He would still say, if you thought about your proposition, he walks by in the dressing room. He recalled, uh, Kaniski recalled, being taken off a Friday night show and therefore not being paid and approaching Vince McMahon about it. Talk to Vince. I said, this isn't right, Vince. I complain, and now you guys are punishing me. I'll finish my bookings, but I'm not putting any guys over. Put me in the ring and we'll see what happens. Vince knows I could take care of myself. He said, nope. I said, I'm done. I said, I'll finish my matches. He says, nope, you're done now. Thank you very much. Greg Oliver, Slam Wrestling, noted in an article Monday, Kaniski confided in him about Garvin's unwanted advances in an interview from 2006. Garvin resigned from his position in 1992 along with ring announcer Mel Phillips and Pat Patterson in the wake of the Ring Boys scandal. Patterson returned shortly after a company investigation cleared him of wrongdoing. But Garvin and Phillips did not. In the December 7, 2020 edition of the Observer Newsletter, Dave wrote, The Ring Boy stuff had no connection with Patterson, as far as anybody could tell, only Garvin and Phillips, who never returned. So another person stepping forward with a story regarding unwanted advances in WWE, this time in the 80s with Terry Garvin. 
And then we had Kevin Owens interviewed in the Daily Mail, and he said, Everything that has come out is awful, just terrible. There's really no words to describe how sad this makes me feel. If the people spoke out, uh, if the people spoke out, went through what they went through, that's terrible. It's shameful. It can never happen again. That's what it comes down to. Becky Lynch referred to the allegations as hard to reconcile in the same article. She said, I've been fortunate in my career. I have always felt supported by the company. These allegations are horrible, hard to reconcile as a talent and as a woman. But my experience in WWE has only ever been amazing. Yes, in the beginning, there were some restrictions on some things. We couldn't punch. Grabbing hair. There was some weird stuff there. But I was able to push us forward, push the company forward. I'm very grateful for that. So this company right now, some of these things are very hard to reconcile. So Kevin Owens, Becky Lynch being added to Randy Orton and John Cena. I think we've talked a lot about John Cena's comments. But uh, if you've not heard those, they're on the Howard Stern Show from a couple of days ago. And uh, that is the latest as far as accusations this week. Seems like every week we've got more. And uh, that's where we are at this point. We had a uh, very busy weekend of shows. We had the Elimination Chamber show. We had the uh, Collision show. I did not have a chance to watch Rampage. We had SmackDown, although SmackDown was pretty much a uh, lame duck show. Not really a lot to talk about there. But a few notes from the Chamber. Bronson Reed was not on the show. And everybody was asking, why is Bronson Reed not on the show? And on the Internet, a lot of people were saying, well, you know, his wife is is pregnant. That's why he's he's not doing the show. And the fact of the matter is, his wife was not scheduled to give birth until after the show. And he not only could have done the show, but he was booked for a match on the show. Now, I cannot say this 100%. But the belief is that he was going to wrestle Seth Rollins on the show. And Seth Rollins ended up being injured. And once Seth Rollins could no longer work the show, uh, Bronson Reed, as he noted on his... uh, He did a, a message on, I think it was on X, and he said that he was in a major match on the show, but uh, plans change. So, I believe that was the match... And no, I do not believe that Bronson Reed was going to win the title. But I think that was a match. But one way or the other, once Seth got hurt, that match was off. And he ended up not having a spot on the show. But as fortune would have it, his um, wife gave birth early. And so he ended up being around for the birth. And so, you know, at the end of the day, I'm sure they're going to go back to uh, to Australia at some point. You know, get a shot to have a big match on the show. But I think that someday he's probably going to be pretty happy. He was there for the birth of his first child. So he uh, congratulations to Bronson Reed. And that is uh, that's the story there. Raquel Rodriguez almost did not make the show. Uh, she has got a medical condition, mast cell activation syndrome, which essentially it causes her whole face to break out she said my face was as pink as my pink satin pillow uh it gets all blown up like uh um when you have severe allergies and she had a flare-up it's actually the one one of the reasons she'd been gone for a while and then she returned and then she had another flare-up and you know over the weekend i guess it would have been prior to the weekend but it was it was touch and go whether she was going to even be on the show and she ended up being okay to do the show. And, uh, but that one was iffy. There was a lot of talk about... In fact, there had been names being bandied about as who was going to replace her. But she ended up being able to make the show. So that's the Raquel update. And then two other potential injuries. Uh, one was to Finn Balor on the show. He uh, did something to his thumb. I don't know what it was. Apparently he was okay. And then the other one, which we talked about on Saturday with Dave was Sammy Guevara. Sammy Guevara did a, a, a senton off a huge ladder, and he uh, went through a table in a hardcore match, and it was against um, Will Hobbs, 
And it looked like Sammy came up and he was holding his hand, and it looked like his hand was bleeding. And so the assumption was maybe he cut his hand on the table, maybe he cut his hand on, on glass that was on the ground. Uh, turns out what actually happened was he hit his funny bone on the table. And so his whole arm went numb, was killing him. And then if you watch the match, about uh, 30 seconds later, he's just back doing all the spots. So apparently that was what happened. And he is fine. So those are the injury updates. We'll try and get Tom on, talk about the chamber and more after the break. Observer Live. I think it's my sobriety that keeps me going. Um, since I got clean and sober 15 years ago, it's it has put this kind of new shine on my life that I need to kick it into gear and continue growing and continue what I love to do, which is this wonderful business we're in and have some fun. And it's all about having fun. If you can't have fun at your job, then you don't really need to be in it. And I'm very good at what I do, so I love this business. And I just, uh, each time I go out there, it is an opportunity for me to be kind of a teacher for the youngins in the back because I'm very old school with a little new school attitude. So without the old, without the old school, there is no new school, right? So it's like all these people do the, all these impressive things all the time. And then what I like to do is completely different than that, and that's to tell a story. It's very important to me because the fans kind of, they have made us, right? So without the fans, we're nothing. And the, the fans that are uh, going through their day and they might be having a, a terrible day or whatever, and they turn on the TV on AEW just to watch us, it is my job to take them out of that day and entertain them but make them feel something. That's the most important thing is to move somebody and to make them feel something. Because if you make them feel something, they're gonna come back. And so that's that's kind of my my goal every time that I you know go out there. It's um, yeah, I get a lot ner I get a lot more nervous at my age for some reason, which is really weird. Um, and I think they're good nerves, but and I've always been nervous, but really since I've turned fifty, it's it's like every time I go out there, I'm just like, oh my god, man, I can't mess up, I can't mess up. Because, you know, there's people out there, they're going to be like, oh, Dustin needs to retire. And I hate that. I don't want that. I want to kill it each time. I want to put on a banger and uh, tell a good psychological story for the fans to enjoy. I don't think I really need to prove myself anymore. But I think it's just an internal thing that I need to prove to myself. Hey, I can still go out there and do this. Right. But as far as proving to anybody else, I, I believe people know how good I am and, and that I can go out there and wrestle circles around some of the young ones, even still today. And um, we have some incredible talent and I'm just trying to keep up. I'm just trying to keep in a word young, right? And it's very difficult when you're 54, almost 55, but just to throw in a, a couple of new things by evolving your characters and changing things up every once in a while, I'm good at that. And that gives me a little more life and gives me a little longer to kind of enjoy it right before I need to switch it up again and I think that's the key to my career is evolving Well, back on the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Apparently the power went out. All this crap got all messed up, so it's just me for now. Kind of a little lonely, but what can you do? Show that picture of uh, Tom, Jared. Yeah. It's sad. All right, well, I guess we got to talk about wrestling then, right? By the way, tonight, Raw, unless something has been added that I'm unaware of, we have got New Day's Kofi Kingston and Xavier versus Ludwig Kaiser and Giovanni Vinci and Sami Zayn versus Shinsuke Nakamura. I am still expecting it's going to be Sami Zayn versus Gunther 
at WrestleMania for the Intercontinental title. That's my prediction. But we don't have that confirmed yet. And we do have uh, SmackDown Friday. Rock's going to be doing a bunch of dates. He's going to be on the show this coming Friday, which also has Bailey and Dakota versus Asuka and Kyrie Sane, and Carlito versus Santos Escobar. And uh, we'll see what happens with that uh, Bailey match because I feel like they're building towards, you know, the big mania moment. Whose side is Dakota on? And so, you know, if they actually do this match as they've advertised here, well, then we've got our answer because it's either a horseman beatdown or, you know, Dakota beats up Oscar and Kyrie in the match. Or something happens. Dakota is injured, injured and unable to compete, and it is a handicap match. Did she really get injured, or did she leave Bailey high and dry? I think that's how you can stretch the thing out leading to uh, to Mania. But Rock has also got uh, additional appearances. Besides this coming Friday, he will be on the March 8th SmackDown in Dallas and the March 15th SmackDown in Memphis. So, hey, we'll see if they can go on a streak. Last week, they did make history. SmackDown, for the first time ever in the history of professional wrestling, a pro wrestling show was the number one television show of the week. That's counting cable. That's counting network. Everything. Tom is so disgusted right now. I'm trying to offer to have him Skype in, but he's like... All right, let's Skype him in. Let's just help this poor bloke. Let's see if this works. Where's my uh, filthy Tom Skype? Man, I haven't Skyped him in a long time. Let's see how this works, everybody. Here we go. Should I, do, should I do the Skype, the happy Skype music? Damn, Skype's not even on. Well, it's possible something on cable beat it. Well, all the television. You ever try to do a radio show, everybody? I always have to hear, oh, it's so easy. It's so easy to do a podcast. Yeah, easy. Can't get nothing working. Well, I'll move on by myself, as I've done countless times. All right, Elimination Chamber. I thought, you know, I saw people online saying the show was, like, terrible. And, uh, you know, after those Observer Awards came out, boy, did people start coming out of the woodwork with just the most ridiculous, bad-faith arguments about everything. But here we are. Was this a great show? No. Was it a terrible show? No. Was it the exact same show everybody expected going in? Yes. Is that pretty much what we see with every AEW pay-per-view as well? Yes. Why are we making a big deal out of this? For the love of God. Yeah, I knew every finish. Because that's the way it should have gone. What, you want... Liv Morgan to randomly win the Elimination Chamber and just do a match nobody's expecting for Mania? No! Why did I bring up the AEW pay-per-view? Well, I'll tell you why. Because one of the main complaints I heard about this show... No, it is, it, is a, it, is a, it is comparable. One of the main complaints I heard about this show was we knew every single finish, okay? You guys want to go back and listen to my predictions for about the last... Five AEW pay-per-views. Actually, go back to every last single one of them. With the exception of World's End, where I was, in fact, flabbergasted that Samoa Joe beat MJF for the title. I literally can tell you who's going to win every match on all these pay-per-views. That doesn't mean the pay-per-view's bad. The pay-per-views are great. A predictable pay-per-view is not bad. A predictable pay-per-view can be great. Now, if the predictable pay-per-view is boring well it's boring but um you know i thought there were some good things on this show now the women's chamber becky naomi bianca live raquel and tiffany uh, this was to me two matches 
There was the first half where I was bored senseless, and it was very sloppy, and it was very slow, and Naomi in particular looked like she was wrestling underwater. And then the second half of the show, when they allowed Tiffany to do all sorts of crazy stuff, including the big senton off the pod, and then it came down to Liv and Becky and Bianca in a three-way, that ended up being very good. And Becky ended up winning, as everybody expected. They did a three-way finish where Bianca went for the KOD on Becky. Becky slipped behind. Liv rolled up Bianca, got the pin, turned around. Becky hit her with the manhandled slam, pinned her. It is now, as expected, Becky getting the title match at WrestleMania. And at the end of the day, I thought uh, because of the last half of this match, I ended up being pretty good. First half, one good. So, yeah, if you turned it off halfway through, you probably thought it sucked. But the second half was a good match. Then we had Tyler Bate and Pete Dunne against Finn Balor and Damian Priest for the tag team titles. This was a great match, great tag team match. Tyler Bate and Pete Dunne are awesome. Finn Balor and Damian Priest, they were great. And uh, all sorts of cool tag spots, counters. They finally went for the Birminghammer, which is one of their two finishes. But Priest kicked out of that. And then they went for their finish off the middle rope. Finn held Priest's foot to prevent it. Priest hit a south of heaven, double south of heaven on both of them. Finn came off the top, coup de gras, got the pin. Excellent match, this one right here. Now, I will say, if you want complaints about the show, because I do like to... uh, I do like to give the people what they want. They want me to bury WWE. Well, there were a couple of complaints. One of them is, uh, you know what y'all should have done? I don't know why you didn't. Is just watch the matches. The show the show aired at 2 a.m. Pacific. Who was sitting there, was sitting through this entire show and watching the 45 minutes of downtime? Like, just watch the matches. It's a lot easier to to sit through if you just watch the matches. There was a lot of downtime, as always, on this show. Allegedly. I didn't, I didn't watch it. I just watched the matches. And, uh, but that is usually a complaint in WWE pay-per-views. And, uh, and also, I got to say this. What match did I watch lately? Oh, it was, um, it was at WrestleMania, where, with the Kofi Mania WrestleMania, which was 35, five years ago. Night and day from WWE today. The The commentary was so ungodly terrible. The production was so absolutely vomit-inducing. It's so much better now. To the point where I actually put over how much better Michael Cole is to listen to. Now, as compared to five years ago. Well, I got egg on my face. Because Michael Cole was horrible on this show. And I do not want to hear otherwise. He had so many stupid comments, like, up and down the show. Like, I'm watching this match, and he starts to tell me that Tyler Bate is a boxer by trade. Do you know that term means by trade? That means that's your job. You're a boxer by trade. Okay. He's not a boxer by trade. He's a professional wrestler by trade. If at one point during his life he was a boxer, then you could say he was a boxer by trade, or he was once a boxer. But you know what he's not right now? is a boxer by trade. And all through this show, up and down this show, I got it. You've been doing this a long time. Certain things have been hammered into your head. But uh, he ain't there yelling at you anymore. Stop. I do not want to hear that Tyler Bate is a boxer by trade, as well as like 50 other ones I wrote about in my notes here that drove me out of my mind. But I will not bore you with any other details unless there's one that is particularly, particularly infuriating. Grayson Waller experience with Cody and Seth. Essentially, what they did was set up Cody and Seth versus Roman Reigns and The Rock. They have not made it official but they made it very clear that Cody wants The Rock 
Seth told him, I hope you know it will not be one-on-one. I will be there for you. They had a graphic on the screen with all four guys. So pretty sure this uh, this tag team match is the one we're going to get at uh, the first night of WrestleMania. Back with the rest of the show, Observer Live. Oh, it was so cool. It was it was terrifying more than anything. Um, I almost wish I fell off right at the end, and I almost wish I'd have fallen off earlier on, because at least it would have been done and it would have been out of my system. But the fear of falling off of that thing is so much worse than actually falling off of it. Um, but it, it was it was so cool. Like the amount of things you can do in a match like that. If you think of all the things you can do in a match and then you add six other people and then you add this huge structure that you can all hang off of, you know, like there's just so many ways to get around it. And obviously I was sharing it with some incredible women too. Um, Lots of women that I'd never even wrestled before. So that was a whole thing in itself. Um, But yeah, it was crazy. It was, it was a great time, but I reckon I'd like to do another one, but maybe not loads of them. Yeah, it is cool. I guess that match was such, a, especially it being the first TNA pay-per-view um, in a long time. It, there was a lot of eyes on that show and obviously we were the first, ma- the first match on the show. So it did really kind of throw me into the deep end a little bit of so many people that might not have even been watching um, TNA at the time had tuned in because this was the first pay-per-view back. And then I'm one of the first people they see and they might not have even ever heard of me. So it was a really nice way, I think, and a really good showcase for me to kind of show what I'm all about in like a really exciting way, as opposed to just being, you know, brought on on TV, which would have been great, but it was so exciting to do it, you know, in Vegas on live pay-per-view, like there was so many cool things about it. Yeah, it's great. I think it's really kind of exactly what I needed at this point in my career. Obviously, like you said, I was in NXT UK a bit, um, but I was even younger when I was there, I was about 19 when I signed. So it's a lot to handle at a very young age. Um, And then I had a year or two out just doing the independence like throughout the UK and then coming over to Canada and we started doing stuff with Impact at the time. Um, It really helped kind of, I think, level me up as much as obviously I'd been in WWE and that was really cool. I don't think I was necessarily ready for that sort of stage at my age and my experience level, you know, but it gave me so many tools that I think now I can bring to somewhere like TNA where I'm a bit more grown up, a bit more experienced and a lot more prepared for it. Um, So I really think it's like the perfect place for me to be right now um, to kind of show the rest of the world what say here in the UK, everybody else already knows. Um, So it's nice to be able to share it and get a bit more kind of like uh, international notoriety, I suppose. It was crazy. Like obviously we done a little bit with them with subculture. so it wasn't out of nowhere, but it was very much like, okay, like they understand what I'm trying to put out into the world. And I think that's the biggest thing I've got from it is that there's a lot of trust in someone giving you a job like that. You know, it's them going, we know that you know what you're doing and we want to help you get there. Well, back here on the show. Hello, Tom. What's up, everybody? Hi, Brian. How you doing? Pretty terrible, honestly. I'm like, I'm like Biggie, <laughs> ready to die. Wow. After well, the past forty minutes. But hey, I'm sure the audio listeners don't want to listen to me lament about technological problems, some first world problems. Yeah, because I've been lamenting about it for forty five minutes now. Well, the show's only 40 minutes old, so that's incorrect, but let's get down to business. What are we talking here? What's, well, what do you want to talk about? Well, we've we've talked about uh, the first two matches of Elimination Chamber. What do you think of the Women's Chamber and the tag match? Then we'll move on to the next segment. I thought that the Women's Chamber was good. It just went on too long. Obviously, Tiffany Stratton was the star of that match to the Australian crowd. They were 
booing any time that anyone would get any offense on her. So she came off about as well as you could have, despite the fact that that's not the role she is supposed to be in. She's clearly designed to be a heel, but she has a very, very impressive offense. And the crowd took a big time liking to her. And I mean, she's, she's definitely going to be a star for them in the future. I really like the tag match and on SmackDown, I thought that the tag match that the new catch Republic, and I hate saying that name, what was wrong? The, New Catch Republic on no planet is better than British Strong Style. That's true. The name they had previously was better than the one they currently have. Plus, we already have a catch crew. Exactly. How many catchers do we need? Exactly. But I thought that their match both here and on Friday night against J.D. McDonough and Dom were both very good. And to the New Catch Republic's credit, Brian, They've switched up the delivery of that double Tyler driver, if you've noticed. And they now hold the guy up a little bit more and then deliver it and plant them down. So good uh, good switch up there. Good change. I still don't like the move. I still don't like the move. I don't think it looks impressive. But everything else does. It's like if everything you do looks impressive, but then you have a non-impressive finish, you know what I'm saying? Like I'll give you an example, which is a little bit less – but that uh, that Sammy, do you see the Sammy Guevara match with Hobbs? Yes, dude. Hobbs gives this dude a sidewalk slam off the apron through two exploding tables onto the floor. Okay, that's where the announcers go. Follow us in picture and picture, and then we come back and they're still wrestling. And then later he stands on the middle rope and he just gives him a world strongest slam through one table and he pins him. And I'm like, the other one looked. 500 times better than what you actually did for a finish. So it should have been the other way around. You should have gave him that spine buster off the apron through two tables onto the floor, threw him in the ring, and pinned him. That's what should have been the finish because that was more impressive. And it was, uh, yeah, don't like this finish that, uh... anyway, men's elimination chamber, Drew McIntyre, LA Knight, Kevin Owens, Logan Paul, and Randy Orton. And Drew McIntyre won. He is going to WrestleMania. He will be facing Seth Rollins for the title. And uh, the story is we set up some other matches for Mania, including Logan Paul and Randy Orton, a match I would have not expected to see in my lifetime. No. But, man, we're going to do it. Where's Kevin Owens fit in? I would have thought we both thought he was headed towards a showdown at WrestleMania with Logan Paul. And if you look throughout Logan Paul's career – They've been intertwined the whole time, he and Kevin Owens. Well, since... you could do a three-way. You could, but it appeared very strong in the direction of Logan Paul versus Randy Orton after that KO punch with the brass knuckles. I thought that match was very good. I Hated thought, the finish. I thought this was the best match on the show. Also, we did have uh, AJ Styles flying from America to Australia just so he could do a run-in and hit a bloke with a chair. That's what happened. So that's... Yeah, in storyline, I love it. Yeah. What I mean, that's like what a an angry man. hater move. He was. Is it 18 hours? How far is it from uh, East Coast to Australia? I mean, you've got to get uh, probably 14 from Las Vegas. So, yeah, from Atlanta. Good Lord, not, man. Not a short flight. Come on. You need to work on your anger. But, yeah, I thought this was the best match on the show. And uh, Drew got the win. Drew versus Seth. And then uh, the question is, is that when we get that cash in? Is Damian Priest cashing in on Drew McIntyre? guess we'll find out. And then Rhea Ripley and Nia Jax for the WWE Women's title. And, you know... I always get accused. I don't know if you guys are aware of this or not. I always get accused of grading WWE on a curve. Okay? Me. Well, I thought Nia Jax was atrocious in this match. And I got to wake up today and I got to hear, oh, well, you know, John and Way and Vinny and they all thought she did great. I'm like, 
Are they grading on a curve? What match were they watching? Naya? I thought she was terrible in this match. <laughs> just sandbagging, just standing there, not taking good bumps. Selling was horrible in this match. Yeah, she did all right when she was beating up Rhea because she had to beat her up. That's not hard. But, like, what's the other half of your job? Well, your other half is to make the baby face, who in this case was Rhea Ripley in Perth, Australia, look good, okay? In what way did she help Rhea look good in any spot at any moment during this match? She didn't. Rhea looked great because of Rhea. Everything that she did was great, but she got no help. No help whatsoever. And I hate to pull the card, but damn it, I've been in the ring, okay? I watched this match, and God help me, I would have been furious. I would have been furious. What did you think of this main event? I didn't think it was an all-time bad performance like you seem to. How about you guys watch the match again and watch Nia instead of Rhea? It was fine. But, I mean, if you're looking for a big-time main event on a huge show with, what, 60,000 people in attendance in a market in which, you know, you should be trying to put on the best performance, the best show you can, then, you know, maybe this was not the main event for you, but having a triumphant baby face, Rhea Ripley stand there tall at the end with her championship. That was, that was the goal. That was the point. Well, I do agree with you. And I think I this think should I'm... have been the main event. I'm happy this was the main event. Rhea Ripley should have headlined the show, but she should have headlined the show with a better opponent. I don't think that it was the worst, one of the worst matches I've ever seen. It was just it was just a match. I didn't say it was the worst match. I said it was the worst Nia performance in a big match. That's what I said. I thought oh. she was terrible in the match. How are these goal these goalposts are moving in and out here? No. I did not at one at any point did I say this was a bad match. I've got the report right here. I gave it two and a quarter stars. I said Nia was terrible in the match. She was. Rhea did a great job. The match, it got over what it was supposed to get over, which was Rhea. The fans went nuts at the end. So what do you want? It wasn't a bad match. I mean, it wasn't a good match. But uh, are you just going to argue this just because you love making me angry? You love just needling me and poking me? Is that what it is? All right. I'm sure I'll have to hear from Vinny tomorrow. Yeah, okay, whatever. But I thought uh, that was what that was. What did you think of Collision? I hear you're going to do a special show, Tom. What's going on? Why don't you tell the listeners? Well, I wish I could, but with the, all these technical difficulties, how can I promise anything? Actually, yeah, you can't connect Not right knowing now. if I could even connect. Yeah. So. What do you want yeah, to my, do? My plan, my plan, and I'd just like to say that I've had this idea for many moons, but all Vinny stole my idea since he started doing his solo show but my plan brian there was a lot of mma action this past week tfl versus bellator there was a ufc down in mexico city rising landmark eight hey sw in poland packing in thirty thousand people to watch thomas adamek box against uh their champion MMA fighter, Mohamed Kalinoff. They had a gi MMA fight on that show as well, Brian. A gi MMA fight. Yeah, there was. I think there was uh, 10 fights, 10 different rule sets on this KSW show. So. Hey. Yeah. Was there a dog fight? There was no dog oh, fight. Oh, man. That ain't going to be top this year. It's not going to be topped in eternity. It's very a possible. On one, a three-on-one battle, unless they get me in there. To see what I can do. Maybe four on one. Maybe maybe you, Vinny, and Craig against me. Jingo's so stupid he doesn't know what I'm talking about with the dog fight. I'm not talking about actual dogs. We reviewed it on the show last week. It was one man versus three. And it was incredible. Yeah. Mike and I also reviewed it on this show because I love it so much. Yes. But. Well, I thought that uh, Collision, I thought the Powerhouse Hobbs Sammy Guevara match was an excellent opener. I thought the main event, Brian Danielson, Junakiyama, was an excellent main event. And Eddie Kingston 
has my vote for best on commentary already for 2024 after that one. And I thought the rest of the show was just there. Just there. Yeah. I thought Akiyama looked great. He did. In that match. And they, you know, obviously Brian Danielson has great regard for him. They gave him a ton. He was basically presented as Danielson's equal throughout the match. So I thought it was awesome. So the story... I got a question, though. Yes. What makes him a dragon? I think he used to wear a mask. But is that the extent of his dragonness? I don't know, man. Why don't you ask him? Like, I just went to... Why don't you wrestle him? I just went to Hogwarts at Universal and saw some dragons, and there's nothing there that I would equate to Daniel Bryan's likeness. So I'm trying to figure this out. Hmm. I'm on the hunt. Well, what I know... What are you talking about Akiyama? You're talking about Brian Danielson, the American dragon? Yeah. Yeah, it was just he's just like he's not the final dragon. He came after the final dragon, which doesn't even make sense. But he's uh he's a fire breathing, scaly he is not. little creep, is what he is. <laughs> you don't think that guy could blow fire? I just watched a fire show at a luau. Brian Danielson could blow fire. He'd need to practice, but he could do it. So Afterwards, Brian laughs at Kingston. He offers Akiyama a handshake. Akiyama gives it to him. And then Brian turns and he just he flips off Eddie. And Akiyama is offended. And he slaps Brian across the face. And Brian says, hold on a second. I, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean that. Put her there. And he shakes hands with Akiyama again and then kicks him in the ding-dong. And so Eddie hits the ring, tackles Brian. Claudio hits the ring. FTR hits the ring. And we've got Eddie and FTR versus BCC scheduled for Wednesday. T- Tony made this match official while the brawl was happening. Yeah, this Tony. The graphic hey, there. listen. Hey, listen. There's a lot of things that happen in wrestling that I'm like, come on. But that ain't one of them. I could see Tony on the headset screaming and throwing papers. Ha! Huh! Hey, I can't, or whoever was doing commentary. Oh, Kevin, yeah. Kelly, it's up. Eddie, Eddie and FTR versus BCC. Announce it now. I totally people, see that. For the listeners that haven't been backstage at a hold that thought event. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Sixteen when I first started training. Um, I think it's a lot more common here in the UK to start so young. Whenever I talk to Americans, they're always a bit shocked by it. But most (laughs) of the people that wrestle in the UK have been doing it since they were very young. Um, But yeah, I started started in a little town called Gloucester, which is where my parents lived. Um, And then I found my school in Cardiff, where I live now in Wales, um, called New Wave Wrestling. And I kind of like grew into myself there. Um, But obviously, it's a very little country. So... We have to do a lot of kind of, if I could get big here, I can move across and I can get big somewhere else. And um, it just kind of snowballed very quickly um, into obviously NXT UK and then here. Like, I feel like it's all happens really fast and I have to kind of stop myself and be grateful and take it all in sometimes. So I, um, I actually got into wrestling quite late, I guess, as a kid. I think I was only maybe 14 when I first started watching it. Um, So the turnaround between me watching it and deciding I wanted to do it was pretty small. Um, But my older brother was like obsessed with wrestling. He's 10 years older than me and he'd always kind of stay up and watch the pay-per-views. And I remember one day I was just off work, uh, off school, sorry, um, sick. And I was in the living room just sleeping. And he came down and he was like, oh, can I watch the wrestling? Because obviously it's on at like 3 a.m. here in the UK. Um, So he came down and asked to watch it. And I was like, yeah, sure, I don't care. And I think it was like an elimination chamber. Um, but I remember just seeing it and then being glued. And from that day, I literally stayed up with him every Monday night before school on the Tuesday and watched it with him. Um, and then I don't know, that very quickly became me just Googling wrestling school. Um, and I literally went to the first one that came up. There happened to be one about 10 minutes from my house, which was very lucky. Um, but yeah, I just kind of... It was one of those things that it's such a strange thing to go and do that I didn't really feel like I could prepare too much for it. Um, The only thing I really knew what to do was to go to the gym. 
so that's how I ended up being really strong <laughs> because I was like well wrestlers are strong so that's just what I did first um and then yeah I just kind of turned up and obviously being so young it was quite intimidating but it was very it was quickly alleviated by the fact that there were so many more young people there than old people like I guess there was just an influx of people of sort of my generation that kind of realized oh we can just start we can just do this and even if you don't do shows for a few years at least you're getting your feet in there you know um so yeah it's a pretty um pretty weird place to grow up I guess to kind of become an adult around wrestling is always interesting but um it's always been very good to me and I've never had any bad times growing up for it What did you go, Dumbledorf? What did you see? Hogwarts. You're a Hogwart. You guys realize this guy did that entire segment with his headphones on, even though there was no sound coming out of them? That's why he couldn't hear the music. It was soothing on my very cauliflowered ears. You literally were wearing the headphones, but you didn't hear anything coming out of them, and you didn't take them off. I just want to make sure that's what actually happened. <laughs> I was trying to get into the... I was in the zone. No, you weren't in the zone. You were the opposite of being in the zone. You were... I don't know what you were. Anyway. As I was saying, anyways, the, for the listeners out there who Please. don't have the benefit of being backstage at an AEW event, I mean, it's no joke. Tony's sitting there watching that whole show right behind the curtain, so... Yeah, going nuts. It doesn't, it doesn't surprise you. He's doing CM Punk chants, you know? I wish I would have seen what he did when uh, Max Caster forgot his rap and just froze <laughs> and just went. Oh, speaking of which. Now the announcer uh, said a word. Clips, some of those collision clips on YouTube, Brian, they cut out that ridiculous fame ass or sell by the. Uh, well, they, they didn't the need mayor. to put it on Twitter because it was on Twitter and 55,000 other places. Well, they cut it out of YouTube. Hey, you know what? I, I'll tell you one thing. I'll tell you one thing. Nia did the sit-down splash on Rhea and just sat back on her belly with all of her weight. And so when Rhea kicked out, she was supposed to fly forward and hit the buckle, but she couldn't because she was terrible in this match. That bear did a way better job getting to his feet and flipping over the top rope than Nia did. I give him more credit than her. And on that note, we're going to wrap it up for today. What a show this was. Back later on tonight with Dave, tomorrow with Mike, and at some point, Tom is going to do a show. We don't know when. We don't know how. We're going to try and fix all this stuff. But that's it. Talk to you next time, Wrestling Observer Live.